Hello, how are you? I'm well. I'm well. How are you? I'm great. It's been a while since uh, we've done this. I know it has been a little bit. You know, we've been a little busy. Um, we'll go into more details later. However, um, it shows because this year, holy cow, has started off so tremendously. We just wrapped up our best quarter ever in history. And because I want all of you guys to be just as successful this year and to break records, um, we're going to start off by, you know, talking about a little bit of, you know, what really helped us get up and going in real estate, some some key factors. You know, a lot of people hear us talk about the open houses, um, about lead generating, door knocking, all of that stuff. But I think there's one area that we haven't really kind of dived too deep into that I want to today, and that is really concentrating on farming a specific area. Yes. I think that, you know, one of the things is you talk to real estate agents and people ask, oh, where do you, you know, where do you sell or where can you sell? And everyone always says, I sell everywhere, which yes, we can sell everywhere. But what we have seen that works extremely well as you're getting up and going is to be really hyper-focused and building a brand within a farm area by being hyper-focused. So that's what I wanted for us to talk about today. Right. And the concept of that is rather than a thousand people see your name one time, getting 25, 30 people to see your name 50 times. Right. And so um, for us, what that looks like was me getting my real estate license and us already living in Firethorn. And there wasn't just one real estate agent that was totally dominating the the, the fire um, thorn market, which kind of that's our first point there. Um, first point being, how to identify the farm area, right? Right, right. But um, you know, being able to have that opportunity in fire thorn where there wasn't an agent dominating, where you know you look at days on market, you know how quickly homes are turning, you look at price point. Uh, what are some other, you know, kind of real quick key points before we go in further that are kind of important when you're really looking at what area to hyper-focus on? I think it's just exactly what you touched on, like un identifying first an area that you want to farm based on understanding what that area is going to look like for you and does it match where you want to take your business. So understanding first and foremost, is there already a dominating agent in that neighborhood? Because if there is, it's probably going to be a little bit more challenging for you to break into the neighborhood. Uh, secondly, understanding, you know, inventory and how quickly homes move there, how many transactions happen there in a year. Is it sufficient to be able to help you in growing your business? And then also understanding the average price point of the neighborhood. Is that the price point that you want to work in? You know, do you want to focus in the 300,000, 600,000? Like, where do you want to be? So understanding like those three components are key in identifying the farm area that you should want to farm. And then, of course, making it sure that it's, you know, somewhat convenient for you to where you're going to actually be able to farm the area very consistently. Right. So I was able to actually check all those boxes, including the convenience factor, because I did live in Firethorn. I had actually just moved to Firethorn at the same time that I got my real estate license. So not only was I able to, you know, do all of those things that we talked about, um, but I was always I was also able to build like these genuine relationship with our neighbors, with our community, by, you know, being present, by sponsoring events, um, getting FaceTime with the neighbors, at, like the quarterly get-togethers. I was on the events committee, so I was actually a part of putting those parties together. Um, so you look at all those things, and it really was just the perfect recipe for dominating an area. And um, at that time, we really didn't focus on anywhere outside of Firethorn. We didn't try to touch Katy. We didn't try to touch Cinco, Fulcher, Cinco Ranch. We focused so much on Firethorn, so much so that I remember us walking up to a listing appointment <laughs> one time. That was back in the day when I used to do a list listing appointments with you. Um, and the neighbor opened the door and he's like, so ha has have the neighbors started uh, referencing Firethorn, Freerthorn yet? because we had become such a name in the area um, and it kind of stuck, you know, a few of the neighbors started calling it Freer Thorn. So I like to kind of talk about like how we did that, right? Because if we're talking about hyper-focus and identifying a farm area, for someone like yourself, when you started, 
you, you had no business in Firethorn. So what did that look like? And I think, you know, people want to understand, okay, now that I've identified the farm area, now how do I go about farming it? And I think the biggest thing is, you know, if you don't have listings there yet, you know, start by finding and building relationships with agents or an agent who does have a listing there, you know, offering to do an open house for them. And then that way you can start working on getting some of your own brand out there by having open house signs consistently until you get your own, you know, focus on maybe going out and flyering around other homes that have sold in that neighborhood. It doesn't have to be your listing, right? But being able to just showcase value adds that you can bring to the neighborhood by what it is that you may do differently in comparison to what other agents are currently doing in the neighborhood. Right. Uh, the things, all the things that you just mentioned are all ways to, you know, start getting in front of that audience until you finally do get your first listing. Yeah. And I'm seeing a lot of agents really get on the open house train, which is very exciting. Glad to see you guys doing that. Um, but it's all about how you do it and being very intentional with the way that you do it. Um, you know, rather than kind of spreading yourself all over the Houston area, or all over the West side, really honing in and focusing in on that small area that you want to farm so that every weekend when you're putting your open house signs out that are branded, make sure you guys are branding your open house signs. You have people that you are making an impact on, that you are influencing, that you are putting little seeds in their brain when they see your branded open house signs in that same area every weekend that when it's time to sell their home, they see how hard that you're working every weekend to get those listings sold. They're gonna pick up the phone and call you. And um, you know, it was so consistent every weekend with our signs going up that I remember neighbors in Firethorn calling in and saying, I've been seeing your signs for years. I want you to sell my home. When in actuality, I hadn't even been licensed for years. It had merely just been a few months that we had been doing that. but. Because of the consistency every weekend, for them, it had seemed like a lot longer than just a few months. And I think, again, going back to, you know, until you get that first listing, yes, you're doing open house signs, but you're leveraging other listings, right? You're going out, you're flyering, you're leveraging uh, the dialer systems that are out there, you know, contacting those neighbors in the neighborhood that, you know, you're able to explain to them about how this whole home just sold down the street, what it sold for, and just being top of mind by making phone calls and getting your name recognizable, being part of these different, you know, committees, HOA, uh, doing school functions, anything that you can do to be in front of that neighborhood consistently, week in, week out, and that's how you're going to build that brand. Exactly. And you just kind of go from that little um, nucleus cell that you started and just gradually growing from there because we did um, get to a point to where we started growing out into Katy, Cinco, Fulshire, Cross Creek Ranch. And, you know, you're going to get to a point to where you're going to be doing maybe less volume in one particular area, but more volume over a wider range if you just focus on growing inward, yeah. growing outward, growing yeah. from the inward. You know what I'm saying. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. But yeah, because I mean, at one point, I mean, on average, we had 25 to 30 listings in Firethorn. On average now, we may have five, but we're also now a much larger team. We do a lot more transactions, a lot more volume count, but it was because of that we started here and then we grew outward. Uh, one of the things that we didn't have available to us, or maybe we did and we just didn't know it, but is understanding how to get data from like our title partner who supplies us with data that is key in also farming a neighborhood. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but title companies, at least the one that we work with, have this data where essentially we're able to get information in terms of names, phone numbers, email addresses. Uh, we're able to understand how long they've been in the home, uh, what their uh, equity is in the home, what their interest rate is, what their loan balance is. So could you imagine if we had all that data as we were starting 10 years ago, how much quicker our you know real estate business would have taken off because we would have taken that data, we would have done some sort of a mailer campaign to those neighbors we would have been able to gain so much more business. You know who lucked out on that one? You guys. Because now you not only get what we did from the beginning, but now what we've learned up to this point and how you can really make it even so much bigger and better now here 10 years later. Man, dropping that knowledge. I love it. Love it. Well, maybe that's uh, another reason why there was such a phenomenal first quarter. And I want to hear stories from you guys. I want to, I want you to take this information and implement it into your business and what you're doing. And I want to hear your success stories. Um, so make sure you come back and post them below. Let me know uh, how 
focusing on a smaller area more frequently helps you in your farming. All right. So what else exciting do we have going on? I heard someone got their uh, broker license. I did. That's awesome. I did. I did. And I just have to clarify because um, apparently there was a rumor going around that uh, I didn't have my broker's license because I couldn't pass the test, um, which is not true. Um, I've never attempted my broker's license ever in 10 years. I think first and foremost. Full story, bro. Whoever said that. <laughs> I think first and foremost, we've just been so busy every single year just kind of thinking at the end of each year, how do we b do bigger and better next year? How do we do bigger and better next year? And, you know, thank God, you know, it just it's been that way. And we've been able to accomplish that. So being extremely busy. Um, and, you know, I will not be our broker of record. We have decided that, you know, it works best for our business to have someone else assigned as broker of record, um, giving us more time to be able to do other things within our business um, that really see a better return rather than, you know, one of us being broker of record. And so because of those reasons, um, really hasn't been any, you know, urgency to do that. However, about a year ago, um, you know, at looking at kind of where I can be in our business at the time, uh, it was brought up, hey, why don't you go get your broker's license finally? You know, we'll take over doing this stuff for you. You go work on your broker's license. Little did I know that, you know, we'd be going through this whole Corcoran exploration journey, um, which ended up taking up a lot of time and, um, you know, got me down to the very last couple months of my expiration for my application, uh, which definitely put me in a bundle of nerves. I was cramming. I mean, I wouldn't even, the last few days before my exam, I wasn't even getting out of bed. I was grabbing my coffee, jumping right back in bed with my laptop up, my books open, um, just cramming um, to remember all this information. Um, but after my first attempt, of my test, um, sitting there for three hours in front of this, you know, computer monitor screen, um, walked out and they passed me the paper that said passed. And I barely made it out the front door before I just started bawling, crying. And um, we ha I have to tell this funny story that ended up coming out up the next day. What funny story? Well, the funny story is that I come out the door and I'm like, I start bawling as I'm walking to my car. I unlock my car so my little lights blink. I get inside of my car and I just sat there for a good while, um, just crying a little bit, uh, tears of joy, tears of exhaustion. I, I think I'm still exhausted um, until I finally got to the point to where I was going to call you. So I had my phone on do not disturb all day long because I did not want any distractions from my test. And so I finally turned Do Not Disturb off, and immediately I have this text from you. And the text said, I just wrapped up a listing appointment. By chance, you were across the street, across West Park Toll. Yeah, five minutes away. Literally, at a listing appointment. You're like, I just wrapped up my listing appointment. Um, let me know when you're free. You know, call me when you're done. I call you, and um, you end up pulling up behind me as I'm, you know, exiting the testing center, going down West Park Toll. And we get home, blah, 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 blah. But back up, though, because when you called me, you called me and I could tell you're crying. So I was like, oh, shoot, like she fail. And that's why you're crying. And then very quickly, you're like, I passed. You start crying. I was like, they got me all emotional. And I started crying because everyone knows I'm a crier. And so I was just super proud of you. But yes, so go ahead. Continue. So the next morning, he, as we're drinking coffee, you're like, I have a confession to make. So the confession was that as I knew Nicole was finishing up her exam, I was going to go surprise you, surprise her, and go to the testing site. And I see the lights on the back of her car turn on, and I see her walking. And I'm like, maybe I shouldn't surprise her, because what if she didn't pass? So Couldn't read it on my face. No, because you were too far away, so I really couldn't. So I was like, the safer bet is to get out of the parking lot, go down the street, sit at a gas station, and text her, hey, I'm just five minutes away. Do you want to go get dinner? to see what the reaction was gonna be, so. I don't know why that was so funny to me, just imagining you like hiding in the car in the parking lot. I was literally like pulling up, and I see the lights, and I'm like, turn around, leave, go down the street. Yeah, I was obviously very distracted because I did not see you at all. Yeah. But I'm glad that it was a celebration yeah. and not of consoling. I'm proud of you, it's amazing. And you know, it's one of those things where, you know, obviously we never really had to even consider you being a broker, because. You know, we were at Remax for seven years. We had broker there. You know, we 
then went independent. We had a you know broker of record, you know being independent, and then it was just more of a kind of a safety net. And then obviously people would always ask you too, you know, are you a broker? Are you a broker? You were like, well, why aren't you a broker? Like if anything, you have it, and, and if we ever need to implement you, we will, and if we don't, then we don't. So, but this whole thing about you walking around the house asking me to call you highness broker just needs to stop. I mean, it's getting out of hand. It was earned. Just a few more weeks. Just let me, you know, celebrate this a few more weeks. Two more weeks and that's it. And then we, and then you can just call me your highness. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Well, it has been an amazing quarter. Um, off to an amazing, fabulous year. Um, and what made it even more wonderful was that we were able to celebrate with our top agents from 2023 who qualified by volume to meet the qualifier for our annual NFG, NFG team trip. So we were able to take them to Cancun. Cancun, Mexico. Yes. And um, it was just an amazing time. I think we were all in agreement, uh, the ones who had been on trips before, that this was hands down the best team trip ever. Just an amazing group of people, so much fun. Um, you know, hard at work during the trip, but just having a good time and fellowship with each other. And so... Thank you guys for that amazing time. I love you all. And we're looking forward to next year's trip. Yeah, it was it was a great time. And I think, you know, what we always talk about, even from years past, it's like, you know, we always want to appreciate the people who help us level up the way we do year over year over year, because we understand that if it wasn't, you know, for those amazing people, we wouldn't be at the level of success that we are. And we all do this together. So to be able to do things different and to give back and show our appreciation is something that I, I love to do. And, you know, the team trip is kind of like the big thing. Uh, it's literally an all expense paid trip for them. We, you know, pay for their rooms, you know, airfare. Air gotta get them there. Yeah, gotta get them there. Um, you know, dinners, you know, excursions, whatever it is that we're doing on those trips. Um, and we do other things throughout the year. But I just think it's really important to show that appreciation. It builds a great culture, it builds a just a good relationship uh, between us as the team leaders and the agents on the team. And uh, this particular trip was amazing just because of the the people that were there. I'm super appreciative that they were there. Um, you know, no one, you know, it was just easy. It was fun. It was relaxing. It was easy. It was just an amazing trip. Yeah. Like you said, it is a team collaborative effort. Everything that we do each and every year. And so huge shout out to Sandra Breland and Jared Bailey for being the top producers of the first quarter, uh, Sandra had 16 closings in the first quarter, and Jared Bailey had yeah, six. Yeah, 16 to six. Um, you know, Jared's uh, average price point has, has gone up. So, you know, those six that he did was, you know, probably almost $4 million uh, in sales. And then, you know, Sandra, she just continues to amaze, you know. Um, you know, I think she did right around five, six million you know, the first quarter. So, I mean, she's trending to have a 20 plus million dollar year. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. Yes. Yes. So, um, Sandra, Jared, along with the rest of NFG at Corker and Genesis closed out Q1 of 2024. $115 million in sales. That's amazing. It is amazing. Wow. All right. So let's talk about where we're going for team trip next year. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think maybe we should uh, get some ideas from all of our friends. So, uh, leave us a comment on where you think uh, NFG team trip should be next year. Doug would say keep it affordable. I'll say keep it fun. So we'll just leave it at that.